me see here. Noel, you got your Bible with you today? Ecclesiastes 9.10. Open that up and read it good and loud for us. And maybe I'll have Justice explain it to you, or explain it to us when you get done reading it. Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatsoever thou hand findeth to do, do it thy might. There is no word, no device, no knowledge, no reason, no crazy that thou dost. You've got that memorized. I have it. I have memorized that verse too. That is a verse that is uh, should be the life verse of every Christian. Certainly applicable to every one of us and our understanding of it. What does it mean uh, when it says, whatever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might? <laughs> what does it mean, whatever? I said it's a work ethic. Isn't it? It's a work ethic. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all their might. Put everything you got into it. I wish there were a few preachers that would learn this verse of Scripture as they started studying the Word of God. And certainly, if there's one thing that deserves to be all give all, given all of our might to, it certainly is the study of the Word of God, teaching and preaching of the Word of God. But I've tried to live my life by that verse of scripture, even in my old age. Whatever might I have left, I give everything I've got when I do whatever I do. And uh, I'm going to keep doing that as long as I can. Sometimes I do it a little too much and fall over and pass out, but I'm going to keep doing that. And I think it's a, a good verse of scripture, and I appreciate the calls. Did mom and dad have you memorize that verse, or did you do it all by yourself? Good. Praise the Lord for that. I uh, I would think that that would be a good Bible verse to have on the doorway of the entrance of every Bible college. You know, it's uh, certainly something that could be in a pastor's study and certainly should be in a pastor's heart, but it should be in the life of every Christian. This Sunday or this week was uh, my uh, privilege and, and, of course, Unfortunate as well to have to preach the funeral of an 11-year-old boy. But at the same time, in the preaching of that funeral, I came to realize that it took this for over 100 people who would not probably have heard the gospel before to hear the gospel. Unfortunately, it took something as difficult as that for that to happen. But uh, they heard the gospel and... Uh, Hopefully uh, some of them will uh, hear and get saved and put their trust in Christ. Now we're going to talk about something that is important to me today. And I think it should be important to you. We're going to be looking at, as you can see up on the slide here, the anthropocentricity of the static music in contemporary Christianity. All of the CCM movement is anthropocentric. Anthropology, what is that the study of? Study of man. So anthropo is man. Centricity means what? Centered. It is man-centered. So it is humanistically centered. That is the whole church, group, church growth movement. Uh, the whole issue of these numbers generating types of Christianity, I don't care whether they're Baptist, whether they're Pentecostal, or they're anything. It's all anthropocentristic. It's man-centered. And it's not God-centered. We are told in the Word of God that whatever, whatsoever we do, we should do all to the glory of God. So therefore, true Christianity is always doxological. Its intent is to be God-centered. It is doxocentristic, not uh, or Christocentristic. So anthropocentricity, big word. That means human-centered. And anthrop anthropo means human being, and centricity means focused center. 
So the church growth movement is market-driven, finding what humans want and like, and then creating a church that meets the consumer's wants as opposed to the sinner's needs. Have you ever asked somebody, well, why do you go to church at that church? Why have you chosen to go there? And almost always they say, well, we like it there. Very poor reason. What should be the answer? If I were to ask you, why do you go to church here, John? Okay, the, the, pr the truth is preached there. We hear the word of God taught. And I go to that church because uh, I love the doctrine taught, taught and, and part of the word of God. I want to learn more about Christ. I want to be more like Christ. Uh, I want all of these things to happen. I go to the church there because it makes me feel uncomfortable. Right? If you go into a church that makes you feel comfortable, you're probably in the wrong church. I go to I go to church, I, I sit under the preaching of the word of God with anyone. And I sometimes feel uncomfortable. Why? Because my life might not be exactly where that word of God is being taught. That makes me feel uncomfortable. So I want to go to a church like that that occasionally makes me feel uncomfortable. That uh, the word of God is taught and I want that. Now, yes. I go to a church because there are other believers that believe the same as I believe, and we have a, a community. I go to a church that loves children and wants to minister to the children, not entertain them, wants their children to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord's Savior, Jesus Christ. But since people want churches that entertain them, pastors create local churches that do just that with little concern, about the compromises of truth they must involve themselves in to make that local church into a carnival. If a church is entertaining you, it's a carnival. That's all it is. You can call itself a church, but it's what? It's a carnival. Sometimes people get a little upset with me. I say, oh, you go to the carnival. You know, you, you go to that carnival over there. That's not a church. And uh, many times, of course, we'll be criticized because we are cerebral or we are uh, trying to teach the word of God. So make no mistake about it, the anthropocentric, an anthropocentric church is a carnival in the eyes of God and God hates it. Now this is the Laodicean church of Revelation chapter 3 and God is revulsed by it and by its practices. That is the emergent, the this whole church growth movement that's going on right now that is encompassed, captured uh, evangelical Christianity, new evangelical Christianity, Pentecostalism, almost all of these churches have been captivated by this church growth movement. Why? They don't want their churches to close. Let me say this. You still listen to me? I'd rather see this closed, this church closed than compromised. What good is it? What good is a compromised church? If Christ himself says, if you compromise, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. You know, why would we want to become that church just to get a crowd of people? I can tell you why. Because there's somebody trying to make a lot of money out of it. And get popularity and become famous for these kind of things. What does the word of God say? 1 John 2.15. We read that verse I think last week. Ezra, 1 John 2.15. Read it good and loud. Stand up and read it for us. Okay, thank you, Ezra. Love not the world. Then it says what? Neither the things that are in the world. See, it doesn't make any difference if we like them. It doesn't make any difference. If God doesn't, we shouldn't. So most of the things that church growth movement 
is based upon is finding out what the consumer wants, what they like, what they want, and building a church around that. And it doesn't make any difference what the world likes if God doesn't. And we are commanded to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And if any man love the world, what? The love of the Father is not in him. He doesn't love the Lord. That is a quite a curse against anthropocentricity. So the driving up impetus of the market-driven philosophy in church growth seminars proposes a view of potential church members, which are called seekers, as customers to which the church should cater by finding what those customers want in a church service and atmosphere. This is catering to the carnal and how, how anthropocentricity is defined. So this is a serious distortion of God's mandate uh, for the church. Let me see. Um, justice, let's have let's you take this text. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bring it into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Thank you, Justice. Now, this requires some explanation here. First of all, he says, for the weapons of our warfare, our spiritual warfare, are not what? Are not what? Carnal. carnal. They're not carnal. They're not of this world. They're spiritual. Our weapons are, are spiritual. So we're not to be using the weapons of this world, the alluring things of this world, to attract uh, godly people. I found out very quickly, trapping animals, you don't uh, use some of the things uh, that, uh, uh, you know, you don't use bullets in there to attract animals into my traps. I don't use, you know, some of those things just won't work. You got to uh, use the, the things that they want. Well, that's what happens in the church growth movement. But the weapons of our warfare, our spiritual warfare, are not carnal weapons. But what? Mighty through God. We have to be dependent upon God. Uh, you know, they labor in vain to build a house. You know, the, the, the Lord builds a house. And they labor in vain that build it if God's not in it. We got we to gotta trust God for what God wants to do. But he says, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, I don't know about you. I'm getting a little curious. What are these strongholds? What are the strongholds? Well, first of all, it says casting down what? Imaginations. Here's one of the strongholds. This is logismos. Uh, it's casting down human reasoning that is hostile to truth, separated, holy Christianity. That's what we have to cast down. Don't let that be part of it. Now, what? this is 2 Corinthians. He's already given a whole book, 1 Corinthians, about this. Right? So right now he is saying, well, cast these things down. Cast them down. What do you think of when you see these words? Casting down. What did they do in the Old Testament to, to clean up uh, Israel, the nation of Israel? Uh, especially uh, under, let's say, um, um, the Josiah, the, the new king, Karen. Right. They tore them all down. So he says, cast these down. Now, what did they do after with them when they tore them down? <laughs> did they just break them up? John, you know, he's going like this with a mortal and pet. That's exactly, they crushed them to dust. They crushed them to dust and put them in the fire. You see, that's what this phrase is talking about. 
it's not just tip them over. It's, the whole concept is, you know, do what you need to do to the idols that, that uh, of human reasoning and, and this, these things that are hostile to the true, separated, holy Christianity. Cast them down, break them up, crush them to the place where they're absolutely um, non-existent any longer. And then he says, and every high thing that exalted itself against what? The knowledge of God. Anything that is co contrary to the character, nature, and attributes of God, cast them down. And then what? Bring into captivity every thought. to the obedience of Christ. Now, that is a powerful text. I don't think you're going to find a whole lot of church growth movements that are using this text. At least not preaching it as truly what God's word says. Now, during the last hundred years, the assembly of the church has been changed from its intended purpose. Scripturally, the church assembly is defined as a place for worship, prayer, and edification, building up, strengthening, maturing of the saints to mature them and prepare them to do the work of the ministry in the everyday world. We know that from Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verses 12 through 16, and that work of the ministry is evangelism and discipleship. My wife and I were talking about this here just the other day. How can you expect people in the church to make disciples who have never been discipled? And how can you as a Christian who's been born again, who's never been discipled, ever expect to make disciples? So then if you understand that, why aren't you proactive in your own discipleship? Why aren't you training yourself? We've given you the resources. Why aren't they used? I always say, uh, if you are learning something, take someone else and teach it. If you're learning something, take someone else and teach it. If you're an older brother, take a younger brother. Older sister, take a younger sister. Older lady, take a younger lady. Older man, take a younger man and teach it. What happens in the teaching process? You learn it more intently. You are trying to explain it to another person who that requires you to understand it more deeply because what you understand deeply, you can explain simply. So in the process of you uh, discipling another person, you're the one who is actually growing. Right? Because what's immediately happened when you start teaching something? Emerson, what happens? When your teacher starts teaching something, what happens? What do you, what do, you do? <laughs> you learn, that's right. But there's another thing that happens. Questions. Questions come back, right? And what do questions require? Answers. I'm saying maybe the person hasn't understood it exactly the way they should. The process requires that dynamic of questions and answers, further and more thorough explanation. And what does that do? It takes you deeper into the Word of God. I love questions. I, I, I know that when there are people who are asking questions, I know people are searching. I get worried about people who don't ask questions. Right? There's a problem when people don't ask questions. I, I have all kinds of questions constantly when I'm studying the Word of God. Now, most of the time, i got to go get them for myself, get the answers myself. But I have a number of people I trust, and, but most of all, I trust the Bible. And sometimes I have to say, well, I don't quite understand this text, so I have to go to another text to find the answer to it. So this is what's supposed to happen in the church. Now today, the church assembly has evolved into a place to gather mixed multitudes. Remember, that's what happened out of the Egyptian exodus. 
Uh, the first example of seekers in the Bible is there and found in Exodus chapter 12 of people with the hope that they will stay long enough to be inculcated with the gospel, which is often watered down and flavored for palpability, and, and hopefully that they'll get saved, but they're never going to talk to them about salvation. I talked to a man uh, one time. Uh, he'd been a member of a, <clears throat> of a Baptist church, and uh, he came, uh, he, in fact, he was a deacon of a Baptist church. And he came to a meeting where I was at and was preaching. I said, well, aren't you a member of the church? He wanted to get saved. I said, aren't you a member of the church? He said, yeah, I'm a member. I'm a deacon there. And I said, hasn't anybody ever talked to you about salvation or examined your testimony of salvation? Has nobody ever done that? He said, nobody, nobody's ever done that. And so I did that, and he got saved that day. You know what my first advice was to him? Get out of that church. That's no place for you. Come to this church. You can be sure that you're going to get, these things are going to happen here. That's not right. That's not right. No one should ever become a member of the church without having a careful examination of, of, their, of their testimony. Now, sometimes that happens, and... You know, you only you hear what people say, and they say, "Well, yeah, I'm saved," and you examine it, and and uh, even when when you do examine it, you say, "I don't know, that doesn't seem like a very strong testimony." They still uh, will not trust you, trust what you say. Now, all this corruption of local churches uh, defines the Paul the day Paul warned about in Second Timothy chapters three and four. Go over there. It is a day of carnality of the lukewarm Laodicean church. That's the day we live in. Otherwise, what Paul is talking about in 2 Timothy chapters 3 and 4 is a day you're living in right now. The market-driven church is the carnival church that's filled with mixed multitudes without a real heart for God or love for God's truth. Market-driven churches are both doctrinally ignorant and spiritually arrogant. Understand that. Now, does that mean uh, that when we talk about these issues, that uh, we are, are not going to have individuals in a local church who are not lost or not saved people? That's true. We expect that to be part of the church. There's going to be people who come in. They're not members of the church, but we don't know for sure if they're saved or not. But no one should be a member of the church unless we are confident of their testimony of salvation. And there should be careful examination of it. Now, whose responsibility is it to do that examination? Hmm? The members of the church. You're the one who receive members into the church. You're the one who police your congregation. Now, yes, the pastor, the deacons, they can do an investigation of it. But eventually they're going to be brought for the church, given their word of testimony. And the congregation should be giving them questions of examination. Now, when you've received members into the church, how many of you have ever asked a question? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot, aren't I? How many of you have ever asked a question? You see, that's your responsibility, Brother Brian. Oh, yeah, exactly, because it's so abnormal. That's where we that's what the church has evolved into. It is stupendous. Well, I was gonna say assume that the pastor and the deacons have already done like work. Yes. And they should have done that work and many times in that time of uh, of questioning I've led people to Christ at that time, but uh and, of course, then we can come and say, okay, here, here we're presenting this person to the local church. We've listened to their testimony. We're satisfied with it. But it's your job to examine them and learn to cultivate those questions. Now, where do you learn to cultivate those questions? You do it here. Oh, I, took, I gave all my tracks the other day out. 
take that little uh, five fingers of faith and do it. Say, I'd like to hear your testimony of salvation. And we'll examine it according to this little five fingers of faith. So tell me, uh, tell, tell me how you got saved. And I'm going to listen for what? Five verbs. Repent, believe, understanding and believing, confessing, calling and receiving Christ. And if those five verbs aren't coming forward to me, I'm going to say, well, you've got a pretty weak testimony and it's weak either here or here or here. Can you explain to me, you know, these, these verbs? But you can examine somebody and then you can say, okay, um, by what you say, you've got a weak testimony. Not my job to tell you if you're saved or lost, but it is my job to tell you that I think you have a weak testimony and needs to be strengthened. And that is uh, with some instruction regarding some of these things. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5. If you're doing that on a regular basis with people, two things are going to happen. You're going to lose friends because they, they don't want to have their testimony examined. And secondly, uh, oftentimes, um, you're going to grow. You're going to grow in that process. But look what 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 says. This know that in the last days, what is the last days? It's just before the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation. The tribulation is actually the last days. The church age is actually the last days as well. But in this text, we're talking about the beginning of the tribulation, which is just before the tribulation, the judgment of the nation, the church is going to be raptured. But one of the characteristics of that period just prior to the rapture of the church and the judgment of the nations, perilous times shall come. Perilous means very dangerous. Now, he says, here, here's why. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. What's the doctrine of the day? You need to love yourself. The biggest problem in the world today, according to the secular humanists, the psychiatrists, the school counselors, is you just do not love yourself. You've got a low opinion of yourself. You have low self-worth. And therefore, uh, we need to improve your self-worth. I found out over the years that in most cases, people have too much love for themselves. In fact, if you really have an understanding of who you are in the eyes of God, you'd have more self-loathing and a lot of less self-loving. But that's not what the world says. It's characteristic of the last days is that men shall be promoting self-love. And then covetous, they want things that uh, what other people have, usually willing to steal it, boasters. <laughs> uh, we live in the culture of trash talk, right? I hate trash talk. You get to play in sports with somebody and these guys get involved in trash talk. I just want to walk away. But it's just constant. Basketball is one of the worst. Football is pretty bad too. Proud. Why do they boast? Because they're proud. <laughs> Blasphemers. My wife and I were talking about this the other day. The vulgarity of the culture in which we live is overwhelming. The way people use uh, God's name in slang words today. They don't even think about it. OMG is a big, they don't want to say the words out anymore. They just spell it out. And uh, But all of this stuff is just slang for blasphemy. There's no sacrosanctity of the word of God. Uh-oh, here's one. Disobedient to parents. Now, that's certainly not characteristic of our culture, is it? Wow, unthankful. There used to be a day when a child would get something from someone and the first thing the parent would say, what do you say? Right? What do you say? 
because you were teaching your child to be thankful. But that's not happening anymore. But here's one here. Unholy. Unholy, not just carnival, but unholy. That's everything that's contrary to that which is holy. We, we could say unsanctified. There's no concern for it. Then without natural affection, no family loyalties. Now, some think this referring to homosexuality, it certainly can. But I think the broader expanse of it is that no family loyalties. Truce breakers. Otherwise, they can't keep covenant. They can't keep their word. I've had, over the years, I've, had, I've asked people, they've asked us to borrow them some money or lend them some money. I guess my wife would correct me. They would lend, lend some money to people, and they say, well, when can you pay this back? I said, well, you know, one time we had saved up money to build a, a garage, and uh, some people in the church needed to borrow some money to pay some bills. And I said, well, here, I want you to know that we've saved this money. No, it was tax money. That's what it was. It was, our, it was some tax money. So we've saved this money to pay our taxes, and I'm going to need it back. Never got it back. What is that? That's a truce breaker. False accusers. Remember, someone doesn't have to accuse you of something that's true to destroy your integrity. All they have to do is accuse you. We see that, of course, going on right now in the press. They just find false witnesses. That's a false accuser. Incontinent. That's without any self-control. Fierce. Oh, violent. We have a violent culture. Despisers of those that are good, not, not just a matter they don't like us, they despise people who are living in uh, objective truths. Traitors. Well, we have a, most of them have been elected to public office. Heady, high minded, and then lovers of pleasure, hedonist, more than lovers of God. Now, look at this last one. Having a form, a kind of godliness. They talk about God. Is what I, they have God talk. And they do God stuff. But they just, it's just a form. It's pretentious. How do we know? They deny the power thereof. What is that? That's power and separation and holiness. They have God talk without holiness. And so in doing that, they deny the power thereof. What are we supposed to do from such turn away? Don't have ministry cooperation with them. Uh, that's a pretty serious accusation. I could preach about three hours on that text, and I'm sure a few of you could too, Brother Clay. Um, heady, what does that mean? I'm not, I was looking at the word uh, heady. Uh, who looked it up for me? Who's got their phone? Look up Hetty for us. I, I remember that, but I was trying to pull it up here when I was reading it, and I couldn't. Rather than guess, I'll have one of you read, look it up. Many of you intoxicated or maybe you were elated. One more time, Braden, louder. Many of you intoxication or maybe you were elated. Okay. Good. That's what I remember now. <laughs> Yeah, willful, I think, is a common use of it. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. Now, he's given us 2 Timothy 3. Now in chapter 4, verse 1, he gives us a charge. Here's what I want you to do about it. God just doesn't point his finger at the problem. He gives us a solution. So he says, I charge thee therefore before who? Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, that's those who are living, the born again, and the dead, those who are lost, at his appearing and his kingdom. Here's what you're supposed to do. Preach the word. The solution is always preached the word. The solution isn't in political activism. 
The solution isn't in kingdom constructionism. The, or theonomic constructionism. That's not what we are here. What are we supposed to do? Preach the word. Why? Because you correct a problem one soul at a time. One soul at a time. Be instant in season and what? Out of season. Be instant. Do it instantly. Preach the word. When you come across one of these issues, do it instantly. Don't be willing, uh, unwilling to stop someone and say, what you just said is wrong. It is unscriptural, and what you need to do is go to the word of God. Maybe you need to get be born again. Otherwise, someone who is talking has just shown you that they have a problem, either one of unbelief, one of false doctrine, or the fact that they're saved. You're to be instant in dealing with it. In season or out of season, when it's popular or not. Then what are you supposed to do? Reprove. What is reproof? Reproof is timid correction. Gentle. Rebuke. What is rebuke? You've just taken away the gentleness. And now you are being more, more direct, more dogmatic, you, you know. Reproof might say, are you sure that you really want to do that? You think that's a wise decision to make? Here's what the word of God says. Rebuke says, don't do that. I'm afraid that much parenting today is more reproof and not much rebuke. And so it is in the world. What you're doing is wrong and it's going to have a lot of consequences. And here's some of those consequences. That's rebuke. And then exhort. Now the word exhort comes from the word encourage in our English language. But exhortation is not just to encourage someone to feel good about themselves. Exhortation or encouragement is someone here is at point B where there shouldn't be and you want them to be over here in point B where they should be. So in exhortation is to give them the biblical instruction that moves them from this point to this point. So you are exhorting them. And it's done with the word of God. And you're to do that with what? All long suffering. Don't expect immediate results, but end with doctrine. Otherwise, make sure it comes from the word of God. Use the word of God to exhort. What does that require? The knowledge of the word of God. The use of the word of God. If you haven't got it all memorized, you better carry it with you. I carried a little pocket New Testament with me for all the years I was working in the construction industry, either out of my back pocket or in my uh, shirt pocket. I always carried one with me. And uh, when I had coffee, men could see me sitting down and, and we'd have our breaks together and set me down. And read, I'd read the Word of God and, and uh, I'd often pray there at that, those times. And then they'd come and ask questions. They'd pull me aside and they'd they are having trouble, they could ask questions. And I, many times I had a chance to witness to them and lead them to Christ. I did verse 3. For the time will come. Now he's still talking about what he said in chapter 3. When they will not endure sound doctrine. There's going to come a time where this is going to get a lot more difficult. Rebuking, reproving. With all long suffering and doctrine, it's going, to, it's going to be a time when it comes up, it's going to get a lot more difficult. But here's what they're going to do, and here's where here's the combat. You're going to try to help people, but what do they want? After their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. Now. I will say without, uh, equivocally, <laughs> I will say it equivocally, there's no lack for teachers having aching ears today. There's heaps of them. But for a church like this one to find a pastor who will stand for the truth, and I'm getting pretty old, you either have to train them yourself, or there's a few schools that are producing them, but not very many, most of this, 
uh, schools producing pastors today, you could not get a good pastor from there. Now, some of them, they have some. But I tell you, you're going to have to rummage through the weeds to be able to find fruit. There are not many of them there. Unfortunately, many old guys like me are still in the pulpit because they can't be confident they can find another young man. Here's what I'm saying to you young men. I know we've got a number of them here. Become one of those guys. I had a new uh, evangelical, new, uh, actually young fundamentalist pastor say to me one time, he said, you're one of those old dinosaur fundamentalists. He said, you're going to soon become extinct. I said, well, you're probably pretty close to being right. I said, but I'm still, I'm still reproducing. I'm trying to reproduce some more dinosaur fundamentalists. We need more of them. We have a number of them here in the church. And I'm glad for them. Glad for Brother Clay and Daniel and Braden. And, and uh, some of you are becoming those kind of guys. Hopefully, Justin, Esther, and Emerson, Ezra. And, well, you, you're already one of those. Aren't you a dinosaur fundamentalist? Esther? Well, maybe still in the egg form. Justice? Well, of course, Abel, Abel's coming up back there. Where is he at? There he goes. That a boy. This is our job. We're to reproduce. And that's what this whole teacher shall be about. This whole whole, whole problem here. But look at verse 4. It says, And they, these ear-tickling preachers, shall what? Shall turn away their ears. Who's that? From all of these that are moving in that direction, that are heaping themselves up to these teachers, um, shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's the church we live in. Anthropocentricity is what the Word of God calls ear tickling and men pleasing. I think I'm going to talk about this next hour as well. I had a pastor say to me, he said, boy, when I preached the funeral, he said, that's a pretty bold message. Thinking about it. Why? <laughs> well, why, why was what I said a bold message? It's just the preaching of the word of God. Right? But as far as his concern was, it was a bold message. Doesn't that just shock you? It did me. I wanted to ask him, but we were standing by the casket there, and, and uh, it wasn't an appropriate time. I said, well, what do you mean? Why? Why is it? You see, anthropocentity's emphasis is upon entertaining and gathering a crowd rather than edification, building a church of committed, separated, holy, soul-winning believers in Jesus Christ intent upon impacting their world for Jesus Christ. And there's a big difference, Brother Clay. Just a guess. I'm just curious. How many dinosaur fundamentalist churches do you think there are in Minnesota? I think you could count them on one hand. Yeah, there might be a dozen. And the reason why I say only a dozen, because some of those who would be fundamentalists and separatistic are also easy prayers, prayers in churches. Pray this prayer. No repentance type of churches. And I don't put them in the category of those who are going to generally produce. If there's no repentance in their gospel. They fall into another category. I think there's probably... A half a dozen churches I feel comfortable, would feel comfortable being a member of and attending and sitting under the preaching every week. Very few. Go ahead. It's so frustrating to me. You know, I think I've been to a pastor a couple of times. I think churches would rather hurt themselves than have become. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably true. You know, it's probably true. It's uh, many churches would rather close than take a stand for Christ and be the kind of church that they want to be in the community. And the reason why that is true is because if they get a pastor who really preaches the word of God, then they're going to be expected to do something. But today, what is our standard of faithfulness? Well, you attend, you attend the church services and so you're a faithful Christian. 
That's not faithfulness. I mean, maybe that's a beginning point, but your faithfulness is not what you do while you come to the assembly. Faithfulness is what you do as you leave the assembly all week long, and there's a big difference. So let's read one more portion of Scripture here. Second, or First Timothy 2.1. And of course, First Thessalonians has a book back on the back table called The Models of Ministry. The Thessalonians were the models of what Christianity should have been like. And he says in verse 1, he says, For yourself, brother, know our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. Otherwise, we had great fruit among you as we preached the gospel there. But he says, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated because they were uh, pretty grossly treated by the Jews at Thessalonica. As you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Oh, I didn't come without resistance. We want a Christianity without resistance. Talking with a Jewish man one time, and he he uh, he said, uh, "I don't understand." He's a Jewish Christian, and he was witnessing in Israel, by the way, which is against the law in Israel. But he was witnessing in Israel, and he said, "I don't understand American Christians." He says they come over here and they talk to Jews about Christ, and as soon as the Jews begin to argue with him, they quit. He says you don't understand how Jews think. He says, the Jews expect to debate. They'll debate even among themselves within their own synagogues. But they expect to debate. Here, what happens in our country? We don't want to debate. We don't want to di discuss differences. If there's a difference, we just ignore it. I find it in pastor's conferences. I've been to a number of them. Every time there's a disagreement... We don't want to sit down and say, well, you know, let's sit down and have a conversation about this. And I'll listen to what you have to say and you listen to what I have to say. And maybe we'll find out we're both wrong. Maybe we'll find out one of us is right and we, the other one can repent and I'll help you. You know, <laughs> that's the way pastors think. But uh, uh, he says, as you know, at Philippi, we're bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. We weren't trying to fool anybody. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. God's the one that's eventually going to measure everything, and you're going to be accountable for it. But not as pleasing men. Today, the opposite is true. We have the reductionist movement, which began back, uh, of course, in liberalism, came out of new evangelicalism, which began to reduce the biblical responses to the gospel. Uh, the four spiritual laws of Graham, which took essentially the conversation about sin, repentance out, and then just believe in Jesus to varying degrees. You could come and bring your religion along with you and no one would ever contradict you. Come forward at a Graham crusade and so the counselor would say, well, what is your religious background? And they would lead you, direct you to a, one of your own people, a Lutheran, Catholic, whatever it was. And then from there, you would be renewed in your faith, which was wrong. That was wrong faith. And then verse 5, for neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, God, God bears testimony, nor men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. When I'm going to deal with people, I often ask them, can I be brutally honest with you? Why? What's my principle? Speak. At the level of your concern. I say, can I be brutally honest with you? What am I saying? I'm going to say something that's probably going to upset you. But it needs to be said. 
Do you want me to tell you the truth or do you want me to lie to you? I'll often say those things because I'm not going to lie to you. But I will tell you the truth. I think you've got some major spiritual problems. Now, if you were wise, you would want somebody who would be that upfront with you. You'd go to them and ask them to do that. Pastors are observers. They watch. In most cases, they know you better than you know you. And they're just waiting for an opportunity. But unfortunately, oftentimes, an opportunity to come and discuss the things they see require what? A crisis. A crisis before that person will listen and hear. Don't let that happen. Don't let God create a crisis before you get the help you need. Go and seek out the counsel of someone who loves you and cares for you. He's willing to tell you the truth, even though it's going to hurt. When I went and got my heart surgery, I didn't ask the doctor. I didn't say, is this going to hurt? Because what? I knew it was. I knew it was going to hurt. I knew it was going to hurt for a long time. It took almost six months before it stopped hurting and got better. But boy, I'm glad I did it. <laughs> That's where we are, friends. we got to close. Let me see. Emerson, we didn't have you read any scripture today, did we? We better have you pray, otherwise you forget how to do it. Would you close us in prayer?